Hello everyone. I want to bring you into some conversations that we've been having at The Ransom about the way we do life groups. As you know, we believe that our call from God is to make disciples who make disciples. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus every day in all that they do. A disciple understands that to be a Christian is more than simply having certain beliefs. It's a way of life where we try to learn from Jesus every single day and teach others to do the same. We've come to believe that the best way for disciples to be made is in one-on-one -on -one relationships. In fact, right now we have around 80 people doing just that with our Discipleship Pathway. It's been exciting to hear all the amazing ways that God has been changing lives even after just a few weeks of discipleship. We're excited to be at the beginning of what we hope will be a new movement of discipleship unleashed across our city. However, all this does create a problem. Specifically, if we want more and more people to be in one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationships, what does that mean for life groups? We all have only so much time during the week to try to do both discipleship and a group, not to mention serving and worship might be a bit more than many of our schedules can handle. So let me take a moment to share how we're beginning to think about the role of life groups within the broader picture of discipleship. First, since we're so committed to starting a healthy movement of discipleship in our church, we have decided to de-emphasize life groups for a season so that we can emphasize discipleship. This is why, as you may have noticed, there have been no life group signups this fall. A church can only do so many things well, and in this season of building a culture of discipleship, we've decided to eliminate something that may have competed with that. However, it's important to understand that we are not getting rid of life groups. The truth is, being in community is a vital part of discipleship. So it wouldn't make sense to get rid of groups in order to do discipleship because community is a crucial part of discipleship. Rather, we're changing how we think about them. While it's true that groups are a crucial part of discipleship, they're simply that, a part of it. Churches, ourselves included, have often expected groups to do all or most of the discipleship process, and we're realizing that's not what they're made for. While groups are an essential part of the puzzle, research and experience show that including one-on-one -on -one discipleship into your routine is the best way to promote spiritual growth. We're not at all trying to dismantle your group. Many of your groups have been incredible sources of encouragement and support and growth over the years. However, we do want to challenge you to ask how your group fits into the broader vision of discipleship at The Ransom. So let me give you some options to think about. Number one, you could go like this. Your group meets as it is right now. Plus, you challenge one another to disciple someone. If you feel like you have the time for both, great. Our discipleship pathway works best if you meet at least every other week. If your group is feeling aggressive, then go for it. Let your group be a place where you can hold one another accountable, discuss the victories and the difficulties of discipleship, and maybe you can even invite your disciples into the group, or you can disciple one another within your group. Second idea is your group could meet every other week, and then you meet with the disciples the opposite week. It's pretty straightforward. And number three, your group meets once a month and becomes a core group. Now, what's a core group? A core group is a new concept that we're developing where people who are in the discipleship pathway get together for discussion and community. Then, as people are discipled through the pathway, those who are newly discipled form a core group of their own and invite their disciples into it. In this way, core groups will multiply, and if you think that your group might want to transition into a core group and you'd like more information, please let me know. The bottom line here is that we want to give you flexibility in how your group functions because we want to move people into discipleship. We're hoping that eventually we can form new core groups out of those who are in the discipleship pathway. However, this winter we will be launching periodic classes and Bible studies as a way for people to connect and learn. That will be a great way to learn more about the Bible or a specific topic or just to get to know more people. So we're excited for the next chapter at The Ransom and we hope that you'll help us realize this new vision. It is, in fact, a very old vision, one that reaches back to Jesus himself. Jesus said this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Happy discipling. This week we are in week three of the series, Directions of Discipleship. 
we're discussing the third arrow, which is the forward arrow, justice and mercy. This is where we as disciples move out into the world in order to bring God's new creation to places that are broken and hurting. In this sermon, I use the parable of the Good Samaritan. You'll dig into that in your discussion, but since this is one of the more well-known passages of scripture, uh, I thought I'd rewrite it in modern day terms so that we might feel the force of the parable in a new way. So here it is. Jesus replied with a story. There was a homeless family on the side of the road, poor and destitute. A Catholic priest came upon them, but he was in a hurry to get to mass, so he pretended not to notice. Next, an evangelical pastor came along, but he was late for a board meeting, so he switched lanes and kept driving. Finally, the leader of the Sioux Falls Free Thinkers drove up. When he saw them, he pulled over, welcomed them into his car, and took them to a motel where he paid for a week's stay. The next few days, he helped the father find a job and made sure they had everything they needed. Now, if the ending of that story bothers you, you're not alone. In fact, this is probably how Jesus' audience would have felt too. Jesus was demonstrating that it's not about knowing the right things, but about actually doing them. In this case, the atheist, or the Samaritan, is the one who actually did it. The whole point of this sermon was that disciples run against the current straight into the broken places. When the whole world is walking on by, disciples are the ones who turn aside and help, or at least that's the way it ought to be. However, we know that sometimes Christians don't act like we should. Justice has become something of a political term in our day and age, and as a result, sometimes we forget that our faith was founded upon a radical vision of justice for those who are hurting. In fact, as we talked about in the sermon, the earliest Christians were so radically loving that we still feel the effects of it today. Our ancestors in the faith turned the world upside down because they cared for the sick, visited the imprisoned, gave to the poor. They did these things at much cost to themselves. It was a revolution in our moral framework and it all began with Jesus. What was profound about the Good Samaritan is that he wasn't looking to be a hero. He just turned aside and helped with the need that he saw right in front of him. It's like Jesus is telling us to see what's right here, right now. The way we put it in the sermon was, what is my here? In other words, what is the need that God has uniquely gifted you to meet right here where you are? Remember, we'll never turn aside if we're already turned inward. For some of us, figuring out what our here is may involve the painful process of learning to become less self-focused first. Your here is the broken place God has you that you are uniquely positioned to fix. So what is that for you? Let's take some time to discuss it with your group.